sponsored in part by Digital Dowsing. Who are you powered by? For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy. To ghostly phenomena in our own backyard. We will dive into our psychic abilities. And explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Ho ho! Welcome! Yeah! Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. It's our three year anniversary show. Three years, can you believe it? No. 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 <laughs> mm. Well, anyway, want to say hello, of course, uh, in the control center. Matt and Andrew, how are you guys this evening? Hey, Jeff. Excellent. Uh, happy three years. Three years, I know. I, it's, uh, it seems like it was only yesterday, and uh, it wasn't, though. It was three years ago. Sarah, of course, in communications, how are you this evening? Fine. No complaints. A little wet, but I'm drying off. Yeah. Good, good. It's pouring out there. Um, but we also do want to say greetings to ZTV in Akron, Ohio. Thanks for picking up our mothership transmissions, guys. We're happy to have you. Yay! Yay! Ohio! Good to have you guys here. So it's a three-year special, and tonight it's all about you guys. We're going to be hearing from various oddballs all around the country about their own paranormal encounters. We're going to share ours. We're going to answer some of your questions from the chat room and from uh, email this week. It's going to be awesome. Our own Dr. Drek whipped up a little something in his lab to celebrate our three years. Check it out. Greetings, oddballs. Dr. Drek here, wishing 30 odd minutes happy anniversary. I'm glad to be part of the oddballs here. And for this occasion, I have invented a no cal cake. A huge anniversary cake, seven layers. Beautiful, isn't it? Oh, what's that? You can't see it? <laughs> well, that's the beauty of it, and that's why it's a no-cal cake. Because, you see, I've invented an invisible cake, so if you can't see it, you can't eat it. If you can't eat it, then you can't gain weight off of it. Isn't it, isn't it just, just maddeningly beautiful? I just think it is. Oh, oh I forgot. I haven't taken my meds lately. But anyway, uh, it's a beautiful cake if you could see it. And you know something? I don't even know where it is right now. It could be over there or over here. Oh, oh God. It's right, oh, it's right next to me. Oh, oh, I got frosting all over my sleeve and... Ooh. Ah, oh, jeez. Chocolate frosting. Mm. 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 Well, it's right here. I might as well dig in. Oh, I just love it. Devil's food. Mm. Happy anniversary. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Drake. Hey. Quick hug and all the cake. We're going to let that guy out more often. Of course we do. We love him dearly. He's in our lab. We rarely let him out, and uh, he's Dr. Drek. Okay, all week long, last couple of weeks on Twitter, Facebook, and an email, we asked you to contact us, and you did. Sarah? Bumper? <laughs> ah. I can just leap in and do it. Yeah. We're sorry. The number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Three years later, and yeah. we're still working it out. Someone's getting fired. All right. Yes, we do have an email, and it's a good one. It says, hey, Oddball Crew, I'm so happy that you guys have been doing this this long. You guys are really great at what you've been doing and keeping us informed of everything odd that goes on in this world of ours. I've been thinking of what question to ask you guys, and I finally came up with one. How did the four of you meet? When and how was 30 Odd Minutes created? You guys rock. Can't wait to see more from the mothership. Sincerely, Julia from Malvern, Pennsylvania. Mm. So... How did we meet? How did we meet? How it's a, did we meet? It's an interesting story. You know, it's funny. I remember a really bright light in the sky. And then, uh, I don't know, Matt, what, what was after that? Uh, first time I remember being with you guys, you, you were trying to talk me into hot wiring a fusion reactor. Hmm. I woke up with my clothes on backwards. That's all I remember. Sarah? You know, the last thing I remember, I was in my bed dreaming of unicorns, and then I woke up and I thought, gee, I must be uh, abducted by aliens, but no, it was just you bozos, and that's all I know. Every Tuesday, I somehow wind up back here. Very you. strange. Yeah, yeah, an empty Great. field, we're on a ship, and here we are three years later. Incredible. And it was three years ago that we embarked on a mission to explore the unexplained. 
we would go wherever the paranormal and our mothership would take us. What started small has grown thanks to you oddballs out there. Our transmissions have been received on over 150 cable stations in 32 states and three countries. We receive tens of thousands of downloads each month on iTunes, YouTube, and Roku, and we reach you live each week through the web. Tonight, we're going to look back, plus we're going to hear from some of you out there about some of your most profound paranormal encounters. It's going to be a great show, but let's begin with a clip from our very first mission. Take a look. Five minutes, I'm Jeff Belanger, our very first show here tonight. Can I get a round of applause? Would it kill you? Huh? Yeah, thanks guys. All right, uh, this is a new kind of show. We're going to be talking about all kinds of subjects, from the paranormal, the unusual, the unexplained, and, uh, and tonight will be no different. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've come a long way in those last three years, haven't we? <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> Matt, Andrew, you guys were there. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and we had to start things off with a glitch. Yeah, isn't that funny? Like, so, so the very first seconds of the show starts with, you know, the, the audio dropout, which is, you know... It's been three years. We still make mistakes. Glitches are us. We, we do make mistakes. Sarah came along. Well, Sarah, when, when did you jump in? It was like... Uh, it was like episode six. Like the sixth mission, huh? Yeah. yeah it was pretty early on. You've been with us since. Yeah. And here we are. Here so we much are. better since then. Of course it got so much better. We, we make less at, mistakes. At the sixth episode. Right. That's right. the line in the sand. The yeah. first five were practiced. Exactly. Right on. All right, cool. So tonight we talked, we're going to talk about your experiences. And, and our first guess up is uh, Chris Winger. And Chris Winger had an experience in Maryland uh, when he was out with his uncle. Chris, can you hear me? Are you there? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, man. Tell us what happened. What, what did you see when you were out in Maryland with your uncle? Well, it was approximately uh, 18 years ago. Um, we were um, hunting in our guns at a farm that we used to hunt at. And uh, we you know, caught an object out of the corner of our eye out in the distance, probably about 100 yards away um, across a creek. Um, and it appeared to be moving back and forth through the brush and grabbed a hold of a tree and started to shake it. I had a, um, a four-power rifle scope with me, and I, I peered through the, um, the scope and observed what appeared to be a large, hairy creature. Um, grabbing a hold of this tree and shaking. This is about a 40 or 50 foot tree. It wasn't just a little tree. That's what amazed me the most about this thing was its strength. Um, I couldn't get a really good idea of the height on it, but I, I could see that about the uh, the torso of the body was about four feet high. Um, but it was very muscular that I remember. It had a V-back shape and uh, you could actually see the muscles turn through the uh, hair. A million dollar question, did you think to take a shot at it? <laughs> you know what, uh, the type of gun I had that day probably wouldn't have done anything to it. Right, understood. So, I mean, did your uncle make anything of it? Um, you know what, there was more than one of us there as my uncle and about three or four other hunting buddies. Um, we all could not explain it. Um, it. It was just an amazing thing, and we didn't really talk about it until this year. And um, I actually reported it to the BFRO this year, and they made a, a Class A uh, report about uh, what we experienced. And, and does something like that shake you up? I mean, you're a hunter. You know what's supposed to be out in the woods. You know what deer look like and other animals and... and and stuff like that. I mean, does it does it make you fearful to go back out there? Yeah. Well, no. I mean, this was like a, a life once in a lifetime experience. Now, this was during the day. It was broad daylight. Um, it was pretty far away, and I definitely could tell it was not a bear. You know, a lot of people ask me that if it was a bear. I've seen bears out in the wild before. This looked nothing like a bear. It had a, a lot more of a male shape to it they were human shape i should say yeah it, it, it was amazing that's so cool and that's the thing about paranormal experiences right is it's just it's it's it is sometimes this once in a lifetime thing and and it, it's it's you can close your eyes and relive it it's not that different than someone who says they've seen a ghost or a ufo or an alien or something else it's just life-changing because it shakes up everything that you thought you knew about the world around you. Man, I appreciate you, you coming on and, uh, and sharing that with us, Chris. Thank you so much for doing that. 
Okay, thank you, Jeff. All right, take care, man. Oh, that's a great encounter. Isn't that amazing, yeah. guys? I mean, you know, Sarah, you don't believe in Bigfoot, correct? No, I do not. Because he believes in you. <laughs> Let me tell you that right now. No, but seriously, here's the thing about, you know, I've lived where I lived for the last 10 years, and I've seen all kinds of various animals in my backyard. I know what should be there, and I know what shouldn't be there. I, I consider myself an expert of my backyard and, and what should be around there. Sarah, you've lived in, you know, you've lived in a city, right, for a while? Mm -hmm. If you, don't you think you know just about every creature that you should see in the city? I, uh, no. No, I wouldn't pretend to know that at all. Okay. But for the most part, yes, I know what to expect to see in a city. Yes. Of, right, that's my yeah. point. And, and, and my point is like, okay, sure, you might not know about a species of bird or something like that that flies by, <laughs> but an eight foot tall something? I mean, you know, these things don't go, don't go unnoticed. And that's what's so incredible to me is that I, I really feel like, you know, we have to trust these people. They're hunters, you know, they, they know what they're supposed to be looking for. And, you know, uh, I don't know. I just think it's pretty amazing. Matt, Andrew, have you guys ever had a uh, Bigfoot encounter? Uh, nothing other than, you know, making casts of the tracks and taking the reports, right. collecting hair samples, but not, well, actually, yeah. I, my mother had uh, an encounter just before I was born. I was born in May. She encountered it in April of 67 uh, in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. She almost hit the thing. So you could say I've had a, a close encounter with one. In the womb. In, in the womb. cryptozoologist, yeah. <laughs> you were born to do this work, Matt. You truly were. You truly were. Well, you know, when it comes to cryptozoologists, there's one name that stands above many others. That's Lauren Coleman. We only asked him one question. One question interview. 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 We're here with Lauren Coleman, renowned author and cryptozoologist. And Lauren, this is your one question interview. Do you ever think we'll really find compelling evidence of the existence of Bigfoot? I'm not sure that we could. We could not. We need to really keep looking deeply and thoroughly for these creatures. Some people actually say that they see them. Uh, we need to investigate those cases. We need to look for physical material evidence. Did something just happen? Welcome back. Thank you, Lauren Coleman. Always a good sport, always an interesting guy. Uh, okay, from Bigfoot to ghosts, we're talking about all kinds of things tonight. And when you talk about haunted places, cemeteries come up again and again. Our next guest, John Stevenson, uh, has had numerous encounters and tons of experience in Bachelors Grove Cemetery right outside of Chicago, Illinois, one of the most famous haunts in the country by far. John, can you hear me? How are you this evening? Pretty good. How are you doing, Jeff? Doing Thanks great. For Thank me. you for joining us. Thank you for your anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Did you get us a gift? No? No gift? I'm sorry. I, I'm, you're cutting out. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Man, I just asked if you got us a gift. But <laughs> you did. You got us photographs, and we appreciate it. Uh, we're going to bring them up right here in a second. Uh, and here's the incredible thing about um, Bachelor's Grove. Tell us a little bit about how far back it goes. Give us the, the quick high-level history on it. Uh, well, Bachelor's Grove, I mean, I've been going there myself since, like, 76, and... Uh, it's been haunted as long as I know. When I was a kid, I used to hear stories about it. And uh, we actually went out there and saw that uh, vanishing house when we were kids, but we never knew nothing about it. That was pre-internet until future days. We didn't hear that that actually was something that people see out there. Right. And, and uh, now when does it really get this, this amazing haunted reputation? That picture, I'm actually having a real hard time hearing you too, unfortunately. That picture was in October of 08, if that's what you're saying. You're completely cutting out on me. Yeah, um, sorry about that, John. That's how this goes sometimes. Uh, the, the first photo, uh, I believe it was in 1991 that came out and made the paper where you see this, this figure sitting on a headstone. But you've got some photos. This is one you took. Now, we're going to show you the two photos in succession. This was taken with uh, infrared film, uh, infrared photography. Now, watch this. This is the first shot and then the second. You see this figure almost leaning over a headstone, almost like like placing flowers or something like that. What did you think when you saw this shot that, that you took, John? Would you believe I took that about uh, three years ago. I take hundreds at a time when I do it, and I didn't find that actually till a couple months ago when I was going through shots, and I was scrolling through them rather quickly, and that's how I saw it. Because if you look at it individually, you don't notice it. But uh, one of the members on my website actually said it looks like 
it's putting flowers there and there is a grave directly in front of where that is that's amazing now that that wasn't the only photo you sent us not the only photo you experienced uh first let's show you the full shot this is bachelor's grove cemetery here's the thing it hasn't been you know it's it hasn't been in use in years now it's it's getting overgrown in places and uh and it's it's a little postage stamp surrounded by uh, uh by woods now look to the right of the big tree all the way on the right side of the picture and now we're going to show you a close-up of what's right there take a look at this Look at that. What it, tell us about this photo, John. Yeah, that, that photo, actually, there was a few people at the graveyard and that was taken. But uh, you look close, she's wearing, like, old-fashioned clothing, too. And, it, you know, it's, a, like, powder blue. And uh, that was only taken. It's only standing, and myself and another person. We were only, like, 10 foot away from that. So we would have saw somebody there. And that person wasn't there, and no one was dressed like that. We've, we haven't been able to figure that one out, actually. We tried to recreate it uh, in... Uh, you had to like stand on a broken tombstone and kind of hunch down to get the correct height in the middle of a thorn bush. Wow, that's incredible. And you've also had your own experiences there besides these strange photos. What are some of the things you've, you've felt and seen when, when you've been in there on your various trips? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear Just, you again. What, what are your personal experiences inside the cemetery? What have you uh, felt and seen? I've had numerous experiences there. I, I was telling you once before, I've actually been there before with no one around and heard someone clear as day call me. And I just turned around and said, oh, yeah, what? And there's nobody there. And uh, Bachelor's Grove is notorious for shadow people. I've seen so many of those out of the corner of my eye there. And that's what a lot of people on my website report to is shadow people. Incredible. Incredible stuff. John, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing your photos. We really appreciate it. We'll have links to your website if people want to learn more about Bachelor's Grove Cemetery. Very cool stuff. Thank you, John. Okay, Amazing thanks again. Photographs. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that crazy? I mean, Matt, Andrew, have you guys, you've done some experimentation with uh, infrared as well, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had, we've had luck uh, with uh, infrared photography in uh, uh, Wareham, Massachusetts at a, a private residence. Right, we showed that photo. I yeah, think, yeah. You? So yeah. Uh, I think infrared is one of the ways to go with photography in the paranormal. Well, it's been used for years in yeah. the paranormal uh, from the 50s all the way up until today. But now it's affordable to anyone. Right. And, and the whole idea is that, you know, the visible light spectrum is just this narrow little piece of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And infrared is just beyond, right? Ultraviolet's just beyond one side, infrared's just beyond the other. So maybe if, if this, these, these energetic beings are just outside of what we can see, then uh, an infrared camera might be able to pick it up. Incredible, uh, you know, when you see these things. It, it, that's what we live for, this evidence that just makes you scratch your head and wonder. What could it be? Sarah, when you see photos like that, do you believe, do you wonder, or do you say, ah, imagination? Uh, you know, it depends. It depends on the person who took the photograph. Um, I, I take it case by case, but am I a believer in paranormal activity? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what if it isn't a person taking the photograph? What if it's just an automated camera? Like a trail cam or just something set up to take shots? Again, who owns the camera? Who, how, how accurate is the camera that's taking the pictures? I mean, are there any anomalies that are in the camera itself? I mean, I look at everything, but yeah. Very cool stuff. <laughs> no, not I mean, that's an over-encompassing believer, no. Well, and you can't believe everything that you see, but at the same time, sometimes this stuff comes up and, and it makes you scratch your head a lot more than other things. Speaking of scratching your head, we gotta take a break for the news. We'll be right back. There seems to be new evidence that Hollywood is truly inhabited by time travelers. There's been speculation that actors Nicolas Cage and John Travolta are either immortal or time travelers because of their likeness to men who were discovered in 19th century photographs. Now Sylvester Stallone has also been exposed as a time lord by a piece of 16th century art. On a recent trip to the Vatican City, 20-year-old Anthony Zonfrel noticed that one of the figures portrayed in the painting by the master Raphael resembles Sly Stallone. This has apparently left Zonfrel wondering if the soft-spoken action hero could have possibly traveled in time in order to appear in such masterpieces as Pope Gregory IX approving the Vatican decretals and the classic, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. I would have thought there was a much better use for the TARDIS. In other news, the supermoon had made a recent appearance, bringing the Earth's only natural satellite to within 222,000 miles of the planet. That's 15,300 miles closer than the average. It's no coincidence that silver bullet sales were up by almost 3%. Okay, that was me, but I take no chances. Back to you, Jeff. 
Thank you, Andrew. And we're back. Tonight we're talking about your paranormal encounters. We've heard about a Bigfoot encounter. We've seen ghost photographs. Matt Moniz, our resident UFO guy, tell us about one of your UFO encounters. Ah, it would be 89, Fairhaven, Massachusetts. A large cigar-shaped UFO flew over the house that I was in. Uh, very similar to the what, picture you see here taken in Woonsocket, Rhode Island in 67. It flew at very low height right above the house at very slow speed. I was able to actually walk under it until it went out over the uh, field in the backyard. The cows that were in the field took off and went crazy. It was a um, rather eye-opening experience. And what do you think when you see this thing? I mean, it, it, How the hell is this thing staying up in the air? Okay. <laughs> well, that's fair. You know, and, yeah. uh, and here's what's so intriguing, because I know about the wound socket case, because uh, Joe Ferrier, who, who took that I'm took old that enough photo. to remember when that happened. Uh, right. It was, yeah. it was all over northern Rhode Island. And, uh, and, and here's the thing about military technology. There are secrets. There are secret aircraft, no doubt. And if you remember in the, in the 1980s, everybody was seeing this flying dark wing. Uh, and people talked about these flying dark wings, and they were seeing something. Uh, I think in many cases they were seeing stealth, stealth fighters, stealth bombers, that we didn't officially know about till almost 15 years after that. But this cigar-shaped craft, if that was some secret U.S. Uh, you know, vehicle, well, they've never talked about it. They've never come clean about that thing. And, it, and if it's 30, 40 years old, I've got to believe we have something better by now. And to me, that's what makes sometimes these old cases almost more interesting than some of the new sightings. Because, like I said, after 10, 15, 20 years, you know, the government kind of comes clean about the technology that's not so top secret anymore. Um, but, but a cigar-shaped crap mat. Uh, <laughs> 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 Was that party or what? <laughs> <laughs> We're live. No editing. <laughs> Cigar-shaped craft, Matt, uh, is a pretty common sighting, isn't it? I mean, that's not Actually, the only one. Actually, it's one of the most common. More common than, believe it or not, the traditional flying saucers. But one of the most reported is actually the triangle. Okay. And um, have you had a triangle experience, too? Or we just Yes. Uh, 1978, Wareham, Massachusetts. If you want, I can go into the details. Well, yeah, give us the All quick... quick uh, uh, running over my friend Scott's house to go collect him for uh, an evening game of whatever we're going to play. He wasn't there. I walked back around, started walking down the street, and out of a uh, cranberry bog in the back where we live, this triangle-shaped lights came up, floated towards me. As it came towards me, it went over the um, trees and telephone pole, Tilted at a 45 degree angle and just went straight up into space without making a sound. My friend Scott and several other friends came running down from the other corner street and we all, like, yeah, we just all saw that. Very cool. Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. We're all interested in this stuff often because of things that happened to us when we were young. We had some unexplainable event that pulled us into paranormal research, and here we still are, still trying to figure it out. Speaking of when we're young, our next guest, another oddball, Scarlett Constantino from Aurora, uh, Colorado. Tell us about your experience. You were, you were 16 years old. What happened in your house? I was. I was 16 when I had my first paranormal encounter. Um, I was laying in my bed one night, trying to go to sleep, when suddenly I heard the door to my bedroom creak like it was opening. So I rolled over thinking that I was gonna see one of my cats, and instead I saw a lady in a white dress coming towards me. And uh, when I looked up at her, she had no face. It was just a blank spot. And when she started to reach towards me, I freaked out and took my blankets and threw him over her and ran as fast as I could out of the room and upstairs to my parents' bedroom. And, and had you had any experiences there before or after that? You know, we had had some kind of weird things that were happening um, here and there, um, but it was nothing, nothing like this. This was um, to actually see something that was in my room was just incredible. And from that moment on, I was totally intrigued by it and went into investigating myself. Yeah, awesome. And that's, that's part of the way. And didn't you, you told me in an email earlier, this, this house was right down the street from a cemetery? It was. It was. It was only a couple blocks from a cemetery. And do you think that had something to do with it? 
I do. I absolutely do because we were the first ones to have built the house. So there was nobody who lived in the house before us. So there was no way that it could have been, you know, somebody who had passed away there because there wasn't anything there before us. Right. So this to have happened, I totally think it had something to do with the cemetery that was right up the street from us. Very interesting stuff. Scarlett, thank you so much for sharing your story with us tonight. As so many you of you have, the anniversary. we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the happy birthday anniversary cheer as well. Thank you, Scarlett. Mm -hmm. We will be talking to you soon. Guys, what do you think? When you, when you hear about uh, cemeteries down the street, do you think that has something to do with, with, uh, with hauntings in the vicinity? Matt, Andrew, what do you think? Oh, yeah. I, I've always felt that uh, cemeteries uh, are a likely place for hauntings because if you think about it, in the graves there, uh, people are buried with items that are very personal to them, very important to them, besides their bodies. You know, wrist watches, uh, uh, necklaces, so on and so forth. So um, I think uh, items that uh, people had a strong connection to can uh, be a focal point for uh, their haunting to occur. Well, also depending upon the age of the cemetery, so a lot of people were buried before they were actually dead. Too, yeah, so. yeah, that's has <laughs> happened. Has it happened. does happen. Oh, we're out of here. Yeah. Her. Oh, yeah. The little bells on top of the, <laughs> yeah. the graves. Yeah. Right. Right. A funny thing about cemeteries is that we, you know, I always, people ask, well, why are they haunted? I, I think that has more to do with living people than dead. Okay, we want to get to one more uh, longtime oddball, Dave McEwen, Bio Daver. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. You, you had an experience with a ghost animal. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, I was house sitting and dog sitting for a friend of mine, and uh, I had to go back upstairs to grab something, and the living dog, Annie, uh, won't do stairs. She slipped on some wooden stairs one time too many, and so she doesn't do stairs. I ran upstairs and I grabbed my stuff and I turned around and I saw a dog, a white Bichon, just like Annie, go down the stairs. The, a different set of stairs, I should say. And I said, oh, Annie, you followed me upstairs. I looked down the stairs. No dog. Doors closed at the bottom. And it turns out that Annie's brother had been hit by a car about a year prior. Wow. So a ghost dog in someone's house. Were you frightened once you realized that? No, I totally laughed. And I, I said, hey, Pascal, I'm, you know, welcome home, buddy. You know, and I just went back down the other stairs, and there was Annie waiting by the back door. Nice. Anyone else in the house ever experienced the other dogs, the spirit? Uh, they actually... Um, my friend's wife and his son and the other, the living dog, all heard barking in the house one day. Huh. And they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Very cool stuff. Dave, thank you for sharing that story. We really appreciate it. The ghost experience doesn't discriminate. doesn't even have to be human. We have no. dogs, animals. Three days ago, I had somebody tell me their dog has come back uh, to walk around the house that, that they had to put down. It does happen. And, and so they, they saw the dog right after the... the yeah, dog. they just recently put him down, and they've been seeing him around the house. They've been getting glimpses of him, you know, scooting around corners, and the dog obviously isn't there because they just had to put him down. Uh, uh, one woman tell, told me a story once about how uh, her cat died right before Christmas, and, um, and it was the first Christmas that they, they could put ornaments on the lowest part of the Christmas tree, you know, as cat owners yeah, know, the cats yeah. knock them down. And she said she and her husband were sitting there a little bit sad, missing their cat, and just one by one, ornaments were boop, 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 right down off the tree. Wow. And they just went, whoa, what's that all about? Folks, we have come right up to the end of our time together for the evening. Matt, Andrew, Sarah, happy anniversary, guys. Ah, thanks, Aww. Jeff. We're yeah. nearing 100, happy too. To be here. Yeah. I know. There's no spaceship I'd rather be trapped on than with you guys on the mothership. <laughs> and with you as well. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you guys here each week. We really appreciate all the great feedback, everything on, uh, on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Keep it coming. We love it. We're going to be here for at least three more years until uh, the ship crashes into the sun. So, from all of us to all of you, until next time, stay on.
eat me.